Hi everybody, welcome to Busy Bird um, for open mic number 62, can you believe that? Um, yes, as you can notice, uh, um, Blaze and Liz aren't here today, they are actually um, up in Brisbane uh, doing something very important actually, They're, Les is um, pitching one of his books to um, movie producers to hopefully uh, be made into a, a script and a movie. Um, the book is Pride which we, we have over there, um, it is published by Busy Bird and it has been, he has been invited to do this so it's a big deal for Les and for, for Busy Bird that it's been recognised in this way and I like to really congratulate him for his efforts to get it this far and I'm sure he did really well today pitching um, it to the producers. So um, yeah, hopefully next time when you see them uh, you can ask about it and he has some news on um, uh, where it's all gone from today. So um, yeah, they'll be here for the next open mic. Uh, um, while love remains, we are never apart as long as I have memories of you and you of me. We are never apart as long as we can recall the things we shared. For as long as our memories endure and we care, the bond will remain. We shall never be apart for as long as memories shared are cherished by us both. Though land and water may separate us, they cannot separate our hearts. For the earth extends from where I am to where you are, and it is the same earth. I can touch it where I am, and you where you are, and the earth will link our touch. I can look at the moon and know that you are looking at the same moon. I can drift through time and know it is the same time I drift through with you. We shall never be apart for as long as love remains. We shall never be alone. Now I've got to find something else because I was totally unprepared to go <laughs> number one. Uh, <clears throat> These are from... Uh, Um, these are from uh, my book, um, In the Company of Strangers, and if you find yourself absolutely unable to continue your lives without having a copy, there will be one down there. Uh, anyway, um, the next one is Our Winter Lives. They disappear more quickly in the colder, barren climes, where snow falls steadily and covers them two sets of footprints, yours and mine. The snow blends flake by drifting flake to cover them and forms a pristine blanket, uncaring where it falls and totally without discrimination. Yesterday's snow and all the indentations which we made together in our lives are gone and ne'er a trace that they were ever there. The winding path, the one we trod, is but a memory, a fleeting recollection of a happy time, but gone to whence such memories go. And now, that is its all, a memory, and no one cares whose memory or why, for that was yesterday. But now it is another day which brings a new, fresh, pristine path, which all of us can choose to take our chance to make new footprints in the snow. The choice is ours to write the text of our new lives on nature's clean white overlay, or, if we will, withdraw to dwell instead upon the loss of footprints made on other days, made yesterday and gone. It matters not. Too soon the sun, God's fiery orb, will deem enough it will be over, and all the little secrets of our winter lives will join the raging torrent as it rushes headlong down the gorge to join the summer sea. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard. I always like the way you present. He reads really well, I think. Um, okay. I think we'll go for John, if it's all right. Yeah. yeah. John is going to do a prose, and I'll let him introduce it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is my first reading of anything I think that I have. I finally figured I had a manuscript that made sense in the sense that it was a, it felt finished or as completed as I could get it after a lot of those early morning starts and a lot of diligence and rewriting and revisits to get what we affectionately call a first draft. Um, I wonder if it should be, instead of a finished first draft, it should be this, uh, I can't do it anymore, 102nd draft or something, but <laughs> whatever. I've, and uh, so this is where it's up to. Uh, set in a small country town, there's a bit of backstory, but I've just picked one chapter where this young guy and his daughter um, have moved into this town, so they had to uproot the girl to move there, and she's six, so her life has become uh, a ruined mess, I guess, in six-year-old language because she's had to leave all her friends in the city and she's been dumped by her parents in the town. But Dad's driving her to work today, which is another part of the story. This is chapter two in the story. The, the story is called Ivy's Secret. Pete waited by the front door for Susie, the six-year-old daughter, or sorry, his six-year-old daughter. Theoretically, all she had to do was grab a school bag from the kitchen and head out to the car. The lunch Sam had made, that's Samantha, his wife, had made earlier was already in a bag as well as two pieces of fruit, a small plastic bag with a lone Tim Tam biscuit, and the drawing Susie had done of her family that was part of her introducing herself to new her classmates and teacher. The Tim Tam was one of Susie's favourites and a special extra treat to help celebrate the challenge of starting in her new school. They debated including it, but decided to relax their no lollies policy just this once. Moving to a new school was no, no easy task at six years of age. Suze, he called. He could hear her back in the room rummaging around looking for something she had to have. It sounded as though she was pulling everything out from everywhere and throwing it all around the room. Come on, Suze, time to go. We don't want to be late. I found Bear, but Princess is hiding, she called out. Bear was Susie's favourite soft toy that somehow survived their apartment being trashed while Princess was her new and now favourite dolly to replace the one she'd lost. It had been hard for her, hard for their little girl to lose so many of her favourite things, but finding Bear alive and well in the carnage had made it a little bit easier. That was the only good news from that horrible day. This morning Pete remembered Sam saying that Susie wanted to take both toys in for today's show and tell. A drawing of her family wasn't enough, it seemed. Seeing as how this was only her third day at this school, and she was still not entirely happy about leaving all her city friends back in Melbourne, Sam had asked him to go gently with her today. Gentle was one thing, but he didn't want to be late when he told the principal on Saturday at the working bee he'd be there by 8.45. He checked his watch again and wondered how someone so small could take so much time doing whatever it was she needed to do to get out the door. Something crashed and Susie ran out grinning from ear to ear. She had Bear in one hand and Princess in the other. She was hiding in the wardrobe, she grinned happily before skipping past him and out the front door. He was about to call her back to pick up a school bag, but decided it would be easier and faster if he just did it himself. Pete made sure Susie's booster seat and seat belt was secure before closing her door and hurrying around to his side. He jumped into the driver's seat, grabbed the ignition key and turned to his daughter who was waiting expectantly with a big smile on her face. Ready? He asked his co-pilot. Ready, Susie giggled, and they both said, ignition, together as Pete turned the key and the engine started. Yay, Susie giggled again. All systems go, Pete said, and he fastened his seatbelt. Blast off, Susie shouted happily, and he steered the ute across the gravel, past Sam's dead Toyota, out the front gate, and turned down the narrow sealed road that wound down the sides of the valley towards Rocky Creek. They didn't see the dark sedan parked way back in under the tree line against the fence out front of his neighbour's property. They hadn't seen it the last few days either. It blended into the heavy morning shadows perfectly. There were two men inside the dark sedan. As soon as Pete's ute was gone, one got out from the front passenger side and quietly closed the door behind him. He kept to the shadows as he made his way along the front fence line to the driveway, slipped in through the open gate headed wide past the dead car and around to the back of the house, being careful not to leave any footprints. 
In the car, his partner took out his cell phone and waited. After a minute, it vibrated silently. I'm in, his partner said. All good, the driver confirmed. He slipped his phone back into his shirt pocket where he would feel it vibrate, started the car, turned out into the road and headed towards town after Pete and Susie. Yeah, thank you. Did someone leave their ticket up here? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm winning, I'm winning. <laughs> cool, thanks, Jonathan. Alrighty, next up we shall choose Sue, who's going to do a short story called The Basketball Star. Right up here, this is my first time. So this story is written for a seven-year-old boy. You need a couple of characters because he knows them, but you don't. So the principal is Miss Henry, the PE teacher is Mr. Preston, and there's a character called Goo. It's a toy about this big, a baby rabbit. The basketball star. Ah, sorry, one more thing. This child, because he's in a literacy program, has a limited amount of things, letter combinations he can read, so I thought I'd show you. He can read the sounds A to Z, capital and lowercase. These digraphs, which is thechish, hwkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkkk
Rosemary's going to do a poem called Dark Poetic Nights. I wish. <laughs> no, nights as in dark. Um, okay. <clears throat> the nights leading up to the legal end of my marriage were a free flowing roller coaster of grief and nostalgia. In Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound, like the ache in I'm your shaking heart. again, I'm pleading again, I run after him again, from room to room again, I beg again. He leaves for the office again. Here I am again, I'm hurting again, weeping in the shower again, crying to my mum again, pleading to the sky again, curled up in a ball again, hiding in my room again. You're sorry again. You'll change again, you'll spend more time with me again, you'll find a job back home again, you'll put us ahead of work again, you won't hurt me again. But it's all my fault again, I pushed you again, I nagged too much again, I'm too perfect again, just who do I think I am again? You're sweet again, you still love me again, so I'll forgive you again, I'll come home again, I'll hope again, I'll walk on glass again, I'll behave again, and this all this will happen again. And the next poem, depressing, <laughs> is called <laughs> He Just Wasn't That Into Me. It was written about the time where this book came about that I think maybe hopefully some of you knew and a movie after that. So here we go. Would he have put me down so much, ridiculed me so much, hurt me so much, controlled me so much, dismissed me so much, rejected me so much if he loved me, unless he wasn't that into me? Would he have abandoned me so much, neglected me so much, ignored me so much, immersed himself in work so much if he loved me, unless he wasn't that into me? Wouldn't he have spent more time with me, talked with me, walked with me, stayed up with me, wept with me, sla uh, <laughs> slept with me, um, <laughs> laughed with me, heard me, held me if he loved me? Unless he um, wasn't that into me, would he have broken my heart and oh so many pieces, promised so much and oh so many pleadings, reneged so much and oh, oh so many decades if he loved me, unless he wasn't that into me. And would he have found somebody new so soon, and she was like 12, if he loved me, unless? He wasn't that into me, so no, oh no, 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 he wasn't, just wasn't, he wasn't ever, never, ever really that into me. And the last poem, <laughs> when, the hurt, <laughs> when the hurt finally wore off, was one inspired by the wonderful Maya Angelou's Still I Rise. Leaving behind a past of hurt I rise, leaving behind all that dirt I rise, resolute and strong I rise, moving right along I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay, next we have a treat, a double act by uh, Catherine and Steph, who, are, who shall uh, two separate acts, so they're double time, so they're doing a story and a song. So I'll let them introduce what they're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to uh, have this mic? What are, what are you gonna do? Like, uh, it's pretty acoustic in here if you just wanna belt it Just out. leave it, yeah. You know, are you that's, gonna that's stay down there or up here? I'll stay here. All right. Up to you. Yeah. This place is pretty acoustic. Yeah, here. great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to do a story first. And then a song. All right. Did you just want to say what um, that's it? Yeah. Just to say that I'm company? I don't know. Whatever. Just say that I'm company? Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, we're just going to have some flute, flute accompaniment. So this is the story of the princess who never cried. Why did she need to? She always got everything she wanted. One day, she went to her father and said, I want to see God. Show me God. And he thought, hmm, okay, I'll call for a minister, the minister of treasury. So the minister arrived and he took the princess up, up, up to a big room at the top of the castle. It was filled with jewels and gold glittering. And the minister said, here you go, princess. This is as good as God. I don't want to see gold. I want to see God. So they went back down to the king. Sorry, sire. I was unable to show your daughter God. Oh, by the way, you have a very rude little girl. <laughs> so he decided to call his minister of, treasure, uh, of uh, law and order. And they went down, down, down to a large room. Doors opened. The room was filled from ceiling to floor of bookshelves filled with books. The minister grabbed a large book laid it out and said, Princess, this is as good as God. I don't want to see a book, you idiot. I want to see God. Up, 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 same thing. Your Highness, you have a very rude little girl. The, God, the, the, the king was at his wit's end. He didn't know what to do. So he started looking under the pillow slip under the bed, behind the curtains, nothing. So he decided he'd go out into his garden and something that he hadn't done for a very long time, he walked out into his kingdom. And there he saw an old man planting a fruit tree. He was amused. He said, old man, do you really think that you'll eat the fruit from this tree? No, I probably won't. My children, their children, God willing. <gasps> Old man, do you know something about God? Yes, I think I do. So the king led the old man back up to the castle. Princess, this old man will show you God. He better. So the old man led the princess back out into the kingdom to an old dilapidated hut. The old man pushed the door open and walked in first. And there, sitting at a chair at a table, was a, a young girl smiling. The princess entered. Don't you know that when a princess enters a room, you are to stand? The little girl looked up. I can't stand. My legs don't work. So, I'm just a bit distracted. So, the princess backed out of the room and back up to the castle. The old man looked, when they got back to the castle, looked at the princess and said, are you ready? R ready for what? He handed her a mirror and she looked at the mirror. She closed her eyes and then for the first time in her life, a single tear ran down her face. I, I didn't know people lived like that. I, I didn't know some legs don't work. Do you think maybe if I 
bring her some toys and some dresses. It'll help. It, it would make things better. The old man smiled. He took the princess's hands in his own and he said to her, Now you have found God. The end. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know, maybe you guys know, but I don't know if there are any people who actually... But it's what I want to do. I really love stories and I really want to... Because when I say it to people, they say, oh, oh, for kids. No, but I, I don't want to... I, I love kids. I've been a kids entertainer for the last 24 years, but I want to tell stories for healing to adults. The Ministry for Stories is such an organisation in the UK, you might mm. care to Google it. Thank you. Um, My friend tried it and found it quite difficult to make a living, but she did was able to do it some part-time. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a few strings to my bow, so I'm not exactly sure where I'm going. I just know that this is a burning desire and I'm just making it up. Like I suppose we all do, certainly as artists. Um, this is a song that I wrote a very long time ago, maybe 15 years ago. And um, the other day I was looking at it and I showed Catherine and sang it to her and it was really boring and dull. And I just thought, um, this either has to go or it has to be reinvented. So, um, it's been reinvented. <laughs> <laughs> And it sounds something like this. Do you need a...
flowers too They said the shower was well I think they deserve another round of applause for that. Thank you guys, well done. That was really good. Thank you. Alright, now I'm going to sing a song. <laughs> I need Cher, where's Cher? I need my Cher. <laughs> um, storytelling comes in all different forms, as we've seen tonight, poems to, um, you know, prose to ad-libs to anything, even songs. And I think, uh, you know, the way you do a story, it can come in all different ways and you can kind of uh, spend a lot of time and crafting it and, 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 you know, really spending time so that it's the best it can be at the end. Or you can do what Steph did and you can memorise the whole thing, which is fantastic as well. But I always think that stories can also be made up on the moment. Right now, right here. Good thing, why? I know. I kind of led it that way. <laughs> so I reckon Busy Bird Open Mic number 62 should have its own story. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a group story. Okay? So you guys are writers. You, you, you spend time writing. You're going to have to think quick here, okay? So what I'm going to do is we are going to read a start of a story and I'm going to set up the theme and the set up the scene and we're going to go across and we're going to go along lines and we're going to get it to the end and we're going to see where this story can end up. Now the first line of this story is actually the first line of the book Charlotte's Web. <laughs> so we can theme it to animals and whatever or you can lead it anywhere you want to be. Where's Papa going with that axe? said Fern to her mother as they were setting the table for breakfast. John. <laughs> He's heading down to the wood pile. We notice we're running short of wood for the fire and it's going to be a cold night. Are you sure that's what he's doing? <laughs> sure. As Papa walked along the path to the wood pile, he passed the flock of sheep grazing in the pasture. <laughs> <laughs> and you noticed that one of the sheep was in, seemed to be in distress. Jonathan? <laughs> First thing in your mind, come on. Usually a sheep was in distress if his wool wasn't shown off, but on the contrary, his wool wasn't growing at all. It was almost naked. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm wondering where Steph's going to follow with this. <laughs> His axe was so sharp, he could, he could cut the moustache off a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and this sheep was a very fussy sheep. He only wanted the best of barber. Uh -huh. Papa, yelled Mama, come quickly. There's a sheep to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> so all the sheep looked at the glinting eggs. Lots of different sheep onto different outfits. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now let me just say, Maria, you're going to be last, so you're going to have to finish this off, all right? So let's keep going. <laughs> but then the sheep really wanted to wear their outfits to the Royal Melbourne show, where they could watch as the, the wood chopping contest uh, <laughs> was, 
played out in the main arena. And the um, whoever he was was <laughs> the favourite to win the wood chopping contest. <laughs> Stunned silence from Rosemary. Here you go. Suddenly over the hill appeared the strangest sight. <laughs> it was the woodchopper's friend who wanted land for dinner. Uh. <laughs> oh. and, and he walked out of the spaceship. Grab the lamb, <laughs> grab the axe and his friend, and um, they decapitated <laughs> And then they had a barbecue, and then they took off. The Mars one. Great, thank you. <laughs> so. so we end up killing the sheep, which is great. Uh, we had to get there eventually. Thank you for that. Can you see how stories come? They can be crafted and they can be made up. I thought it was a great story. That's way better than Charlotte's Web. So, <laughs> <laughs> not a spider in it. There we go. Almost the same. Almost the same. Uh, next up, we're going to have a group talk between Michelle and her husbands. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, she's going to ad lib something, so I guess it's um, yes. yeah, Paul and Michelle, if you want. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle, and for you, for those who have come to um, open mic nights for a couple of years, you probably know some version of this. <laughs> oh, bless you. <laughs> um, this is Paul, my late husband. He passed away at 34 months today, um, and. I wrote the story of Conversations with Paul, which was his journey of, um, he had a rare melanoma in the spine and it took 12 months or over a two year period, but 12 months he had five spinal surgeries and one brain surgery. Went through radiation and chemo and whatever. But on his deathbed, he passed away at home, he asked me what I was gonna do when he was gone. That's pretty confronting to ask your partner, what are you going to do when I'm gone? But there was a lot of conversations around, you know, him going and me staying. And I said, I'm going to go travelling. And he said, you're not, are you? And I said, yeah, I'm going to go travelling. And, you know, all the places that we were going to go, I'm going to go to, and I'm going to take you in some format, which wasn't necessarily a cardboard format, but that's how he eventuated a cardboard format. And we're gonna, I'm going to go travelling. So in May 2017, I booked tickets to see Paul McCartney in New York. Never been travelling by myself. Him and I went to New Zealand on our honeymoon. But so I booked those tickets and said, okay, well I need to find a, a travel agent and I need to go um, travelling. So. It just morphed from there. So I went away for nine weeks in August 2017. And on that journey, I had this version with me, although this is a totally different version now, but the old version, if you saw, if you were here a couple of months back, he was um, very um, destroyed, put it that way, and he's put together with gaffer tape at the moment. So, um, and I've just had these made. So what we did was um, I took him on some tours and I've written the book Travelling with Cardboard Paul. So it's hashtag Travelling with Cardboard Paul, the most travelled cardboard, cardboard cutout in the world. And so he's been all around in America, New York, we went through Texas, um, via bus and train. I packed him in a suitcase. He's got his own travelling bag. He's um, been to Paris. We've been to London, Windsor Castle, you name it, he's been there. 
So um, the book is now finished. It's with Busy Bird Publishing. It's been edited and it's ready to go to layout, I think. And and so that's where we're at with that. Um, I'm launching the book on in May on his and in his on his third and roughly around about his third avenue um, anniversary. And so I decided that um, I'd get two versions. So this is the younger version, and I thought I'd get the older version. So he was he went. The kids gave him a Father's Day lap around um, in a Formula Ford out at Broadfoot. So um, this is Paul. So that's probably all I've got to say about. <laughs> unless anyone's got any questions, but. Um, no, we had fun. So I've got, and the book sh tells a lot of funny stories about, you know, talking, telling their story, and how um, gobsmacked some people were. Questions were asked. We had so much fun with him on the bus with the the tour group, where it said, you know, how's Paul? How's he going? Did he sleep well? You know, <laughs> is he eating anything? And he doesn't say much. And Michelle, you got to dress up because you know he's in the suit. So, um, but so no, Michelle, we, we have trouble. There was a security issue. There was. Thank you. <laughs> it's in the book. But um, we were in New York, and I went to the Empire State Building, and I speak quick one. And um, so I put him through the security, and the security person stopped me and said, um, "What's this?" And I said, "It's a cardboard cutout of my late husband." And so she went to another security person in a suit, and, and he said, "No, you can't take him up there." <laughs> And I'm going, and I'm, he my, my job. No, he was such a security risk. <laughs> he was such a security risk that, you know, America was, you know, because Pablo Cut 8 was going to attack him. I've got no idea. So we were, so when I, when I went up, and I was really disappointed because I couldn't take him up the top, but I, I went, I walked up and took photos. And then when I came back down and I had to go through security again to pick him up, um, the guy in the suit stood, you know, stood past me and uh, stood beside me and said, oh, what's the story? And I told him the story and he says, oh, it's good that you're moving on. And I went, who the hell do you think you are? You don't know me. You don't know what I went through. I said, I'm not moving on anywhere. I said, I'm, I, this was a promise I made. And this is all about a promise um, that I made to him on his deathbed that I would go travelling with him. And, you know, he thinks it's hilarious. So, <laughs> so I still have conversations with Paul. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. So we're going to have fun on Monday, aren't we, Kev? I'm doing a photo shoot with Michelle and Paul. <laughs> um, and I haven't realised, but actually, uh, uh, it's an easy job for me to get him to smile. It's actually <laughs> smiling in both. So I don't have to do the whole kind of, you know, say elephant undies and all that kind of stuff. Don't and have the to do funny, that. funny thing about him is, depending on the angle, you swear he's changing his smile? Mm. <laughs> or is, yeah, do, do you wake up at night and, and he's moved around the house? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yes. The kids, my kids think I'm crazy. <laughs> but I don't care. That's good. So look forward to that book because, um, as you said, he's the most well travelled cardboard cutter in the world. So. He is. Yeah. And no one else has done it. No. <laughs> It's your niche. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Widows group all over the world, and also on Facebook. And I know. I, I travel don't know whether with you're some of them. connected with any of yeah. them, but I, I know a lot of them. And mm. um, yeah, I reckon that's well. <laughs> You could you could do European tours with wives with cardboard cutouts of yes. all their husbands. We're going again in August, so we're travelling again in August to Edinburgh. Okay. Yeah. 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 Second book. There's an American comedian called um, Kelly Lynn, and she released a book last year called My Husband's Not a Rainbow. Yeah. But she's done all sorts of things over there on mm. the Soaring Spirits group. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're no. Uh, they do stuff all over the US. So yeah, I'll, I'll meet up with her. <laughs> <laughs> They're touring. Alrighty. Let's go to Marie, if you want. If you want to come up. Who's going to do a play? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> so I've spent the past uh, few months um, putting together seven 
art books and this one's called Willow Pattern Play. Um, so I, I was walked in, I looked and there was Kunsi instead of Chan <laughs> on the, in one of the first paragraphs that somehow had been inserted by some delightful Trojan. So this is the world we live in. <laughs> anyway, um, so what I'll do is I'll just read a little. If I can untangle my hair. Okay. <laughs> In many ways, Willow Patton's story, over a thousand years old, is a Chinese Romeo and Juliet filled with love and tragedy, but uniquely Chinese. The Willow Patton play is a new spin on an ancient tale. Taking a traditional tale and breathing new life into it is a familiar approach to writing a play, one that has been in existence for thousands of years. Like the story, the play hopes to entertain classrooms and offer a range of stimulating activities. Setting. The Willow Patton story occurred over a thousand years ago at the end of the Song Dynasty. The story takes place on an estate Kunsi's father, where Chang is employed as a scribe. As the narrators speak about Chang and Kunsi, the actors improvise their actions, and so on. Chang opens his writing chest. He takes out his sandalwood ink filled pen. He glances across the orchard and over to the doorway where he sees Kunsi smiling back at him. His eyes dance in the sunshine as he smiles back at her. The breeze frees the blossoms and it floats and twirls around the orchard. <coughs> Chang, dis uh, Chang describes the Chinese character for happiness with neat thick strokes of his pen. He sits back and waits for the ink to dry. The Chinese symbol of happiness is a symbol of hope and everyone deserves hope and happiness and good fortune. Scene two, orchard. Kunsi walks out of the doorway and over to Chang. She peers over his shoulder and admires the happiness character. What a beautiful character, Chang. Kunsi, don't touch it, it isn't dry yet. Can I ascribe a happiness symbol too? Passes her the pen. If you like, it is fun, but you'll need to be careful. Stares at the happiness symbol and draws the first stroke, which is wrong. It's a semicircle. The ink smudges. Sorry, Chang, that's terrible. Not just terrible, it's disastrous. Happiness gone wrong is very, very, very bad luck. Chinese bad luck is very disastrous. I'll start again. Frowns with concentration. She draws the next part of the symbol very slowly. That's a little better. Copy this one again and hopefully you will improve. It has taken me years to scribe the happiness symbol perfectly. Before I even pick up my pen, while I prepare and fill the pens with fresh ink, I think about this symbol of good fortune. It is the most difficult of symbols to capture and requires absolute concentration. Why do you think about it? It is just a symbol, a character. Why meditate on the happiness symbol? It represents good luck. Here, take this pen and try again. Why is it so difficult, Chang? It is only shapes. I scribe other characters easily. Chang says, yours is just the beginning. There is still much need for improvement. Tell me how. Close your eyes, Quincy. Picture yourself joyful. Picture the symbol and the joy again and again until you think you can confidently draw it. She closes her eyes. I'm ready now, Chang. And she paints the symbol. This is the beginning. Here, take my happiness and good fortune. Chang lifts the sheet of mulberry paper and passes it to Kung Si. Their eyes meet and she admires his superbly crafted symbol. Around them, the peach blossoms flutter and curl upon the breeze. Chang takes Kung Si's hand. Father, father's voice calls and he drops her hand. She steps away, he scrolls the mulberry paper, ties it with a red ribbon and passes it to her. Yeah. Okay. I put some bookmarks over there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks for that. Would anyone mind if I actually tell you a funny story that happened to me last week? Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. You actually want to hear? It? Yeah. Well, I've got the limelight on you. I actually had to go to Sydney the other week, uh, last week, last week it was, um, to do a photo shoot, and I checked into this hotel. Had the night there, did the photo shoot. Had the night, and I went down in the in the lobby in the morning, and I went to pay. And the, um, the lady at the desk gave me the the bill, and it was three hundred and fifty dollars. And I said that was a bit expensive. I didn't think it was going to be that much. She goes, "Well, I'm sorry, that's how much it is." I said, "Well, I can't pay three hundred fifty dollars for for that." I said, "Can I see the manager?" So she goes, oh, okay. So she went and called the manager, and this the female manager came over, and she said, "I said, it's three hundred fifty dollars. That's a bit expensive." She goes, "Well, sir, that's what it costs for the room for the night." She goes, "Well, we have restaurants downstairs, you know, world quality restaurants. You could have used." I said, "But I didn't use them." She goes, "Well, you could have." And I said, "Well, I didn't. So why should I pay for that?" She goes, well, we have um, world-class entertainment downstairs in the auditorium. I said, well, I didn't do that either. She goes, well, you could have. I said, but I didn't. <laughs> she goes, well, I can't. What can I do? I said, well, okay. So she gave me the bill. So I wrote out a check, and I gave it to her. And she looked at it. And she goes, sir, but this is only for fifty dollars. I said, yeah. I charged you three three hundred dollars for sleeping with me last night. <laughs> She goes, I didn't sleep with you. I said, I was there. You could have. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. It'd be funny if that actually happened. Anyway. <laughs> it would have been. I know. Judy, would you like to get up? I'm not going to leave you to last. What's that? Judy Taylor's doing self-expression by the look of it. Writing is a healing tool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My mum died suddenly in 2011 and it was very sudden and unexpected and I started writing and it really became my healing tool. I was very surprised though as I started to read some of my writing which was really for my own survival and I, when I read it to people I have had profound responses for what I'd written. So. As things evolved over the next three years, I ended up self-publishing my first book, Mum Moments Journey Through Grief. And I'll just share a couple of pieces I wrote in there. Uh, very different because I never recognised, well, Mum and I'd spoken a lot about spirituality and about near-death experiences and all sorts of things like that. But when it's in your face and your mum dies suddenly, everything goes out the door. So. Uh, I had a few very different experiences. I'll share a couple of them from my first book. And that became part of my journey in staying connected with my mother. Whilst the physical loss was a shocker, the spiritual connection and keeping my connection alive with her has just been absolutely phenomenal, something I could never have imagined at the time. <coughs> this was written on the 16th of April, eight weeks after she died. Mum died eight weeks ago, and I'm having a mum moment right now. There have been many mum moments over the last ten weeks since she had a massive stroke. Moments before we were dancing on the dance floor to my husband's band as he celebrated his 60th birthday. We were shining together as we celebrated and enjoyed the freedom of dance. I can see her now. I can feel her now. I am surrounded by her love as I miss her physical presence in my life. I'm learning to communicate with her on a soul level, embracing the spiritual essence of life that we so often discussed. Intuitively, I know she's here, guiding me when I stop to listen, and in the background waiting for me to be ready to be guided by her wisdom. How blessed I am that she introduced me to the power of love, the power of touch, and the stillness to be found within us all. As I write, the sun shines through the clouds and the signs she taught me to appreciate the simple things in life are alive and well everywhere. I've had many of those experiences. I also had other experiences that weren't so good. 
I had shocking back pain about six months after she died. Nothing. Reiki, massage, chiropractic, nothing was working. And I sat on the couch one night and said, why can't I get rid of this pain? And I started sobbing uncontrollably. Mm. I can't believe this pain. It takes me completely by surprise. I don't know where it's coming from. And then I'm sobbing uncontrollably. I miss my mum so much. How can someone so alive be so dead? I didn't realise just how deep this pain is and how it continues to manifest in my body. I'm sitting in bed writing this with my mum's shawl. Well, it's mine, really. She gave it to me as a gift some time ago, and I've slept with it, cuddling it, every night since she had her stroke <coughs> and died. Dead. It's just so hard to believe she's gone. I can feel her here, there, and everywhere. I'm surrounded by her love, surrounded by her, her touch, her smell, her kindness, her smile, her everything. Dead is such a funny word, really. What does it really mean? She's dead, but she feels so alive to me, so present, so personable, so amazing, and so dead. It doesn't really make any sense to me. She's so beautiful, so loving, so caring, so loved, so lovable, so annoying, so there and yet so gone. Gone where? Gone why? Gone somewhere? Gone beyond here? Gone beyond our knowing? Gone to a better place? Gone from here forever? Gone, gone, gone. And I don't want her gone. I want her here. I want her now. I want her forever and ever and ever. I don't care about impermanence. I don't care that life doesn't last forever. I want her to last forever and ever. She's my mum and I want her here. I want her now. And I want her forever and ever and ever. I feel like a two-year-old who wants her lollies. And I do want my lollies. And I want my mummy and I want her now. She's my mum. I love her and I want her right now. Can I add this for a little bit? I won't read that. That was my first book and it was a journey in discovering how you still could stay connected. Mm. The physical loss is still shocking in my experience. However, she kept challenging me all along the way and, you know, my writing has become the conversations I used to have on the phone with her. Mm. So my second book, which was released two years after that, was Heart Space Letters to My Mother, where I continued to write to her and I continued to develop. As I wrote, I listened to her whispers. And the more I listened, the more I heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you might be able to relate to this. If you are open to the fact that there's more beyond this world, it's there. And that's what I experience. More powerfully, but I'm going to read those next time. At um, Can I read one more little bit? No, you can yeah, say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's evolved from my mum dying, which I could never have imagined, is through me opening with my self-expression. And really, in many respects, I did this because when my mum died, our family fell apart. My mum was the glue that held the family mm -hmm. together. So I'm one of five girls and I only have a relationship with one sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father, who's very close to two of the girls, the whole family fell apart and it was shocking. And um, as it got worse and worse and it got worse, it's eight years now, my father, uh, my relationship with my father, just it just completely fell apart mm. by his choice, anyhow, really. And I went into doing deep inner child work after that. And then my next book that I'm writing, uh, it could have a working title, but I don't know that it does at the moment. But um, in doing the deep inner child work, I um, took me back right to the beginning of my childhood and working through my whole family to try and understand my dad and the whole process. I came to age nine when I was sexually abused by my uncle. Mm. And this is three years worth of exercise book, going into inner child and moving through to now. Uh, who are grieving, whether they're grieving a mother, a child, uh, a husband, a partner. 
is I was writing in the same context as I was writing here, but I was writing my feelings about how I felt about being sexually abused, how that's manifested in my life and how I've lived. And I've been working a lot with CASA, Centre Against Sexual Abuse, and as everyone knows, there's been so much in sexual abuse in recent years. And they said my writing is so profound that I articulate, in it com when it comes to feelings, I articulate what most people who've been sexually abused cannot express. So they're encouraging me to write a book to draw all this stuff out of here. And I must say it's daunting, mm -hmm. but I've begun the journey. Mm -hmm. So my mum dying, I had no idea where I was going. But, you know, all my life people have said, you should write, you should write, because I'd been writing all my life but never published anything. So, really, that was a gift mm -hmm. in disguise. Mm -hmm. If anyone's in... Thank you. <laughs> if anyone's interested, I do have copies of my books if you want to have a look. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Look, I'm, I'm the biggest sceptic in the world, but my, my dad passed away three and a half years ago, and the one year anniversary to the day of his death, I was here, I was playing some music, having a jam session with a mate, and we were just leaving out the back door there, and I was just talking to him through the back door. There was no other thing on the lights on or anything, I turned it all off. And we were just talking in the back door, and the printer that's in Blazer's office started going, this is like this, right? And I'm like, the printer went on and it wasn't on and the PowerPoint was off. Mm. No, I love this stuff. The day, the, mm. exactly one year from the day my dad died. Yeah. And, the, and we're looking at it going, but the power's off, the, the switch is off, it's, everything's off. It's amazing, energy. Mm. You know? Yeah, it's energy. Mm. It's there. I have a Facebook page with 23,000 people on it and every now and then I post a thing about signs from loved ones mm. and the stories people share with you about their experiences. <laughs> It's um, a book I'm coming up. Yeah. You can't make this shit up. <laughs> you actually, I like the title. Uh, yeah, you can't up. make it up. It's it's another, that's a book coming up. And I think that's the thing. If you're open to it, they present in ways you can receive them, which is different for everybody. But, oh, I've heard some amazing stories. I love it. Okay, I'm going to put no pressure and <laughs> invite <laughs> Sam up now to kind of lighten the moment a little. You picked the wrong one. I know, yeah. <laughs> she, she's writing a vignette. I'm sure it's called Happy Days for Everybody. <laughs> uh, you, you have been warned. You have picked the wrong person. Um, so I wanted to write something new. I haven't written something new in a really long time. Uh, and... I tried, and 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 I, and I know so many of you are going to know this feeling, where you're just like feeling like you've, you've, you've booked yourself into the race, and you've got the number on your back, and you are crawling instead of running, and the finish line's a really long way away. <laughs> um, I had an hour this evening, and I was like, well, I don't have anything, and I'm going to stand up there and have a panic attack. So I may as well take everyone along with me. Let me walk you through it. <laughs> Anxiety is a snake biting its own tail. My scales glitter as I circle back. I hardly dare to breathe. I will provoke it if I run. It's agony waiting for the strike. It sits about my shoulders, coiled tight. It whispers in my hair. It counts the rows of perforations at my neck, along my back, beneath my breast. It tastes them with a flickering tongue. It's goading me. It's laughing quietly. It can afford to wait. It knows to let me trip, my, trip myself. And when I tense, it strikes. It's bitten me. By pulling on it, I secure its hold. I can't remember how to breathe. I'm struggling and the tension feeds the beast. I know, of course, that human beings are required to breathe. My body feels strangely detached. 
I look about for lung muscles responsible for bringing in the air. They're weary, they're heavy. I tell them that they must. They wave me off, they want to rest. They never rest, they cannot rest. I tell them they must bring the air inside. They drag in one long breath. Are you happy? I am, I say, and now again. They are not listening. They are weary, they are heavy. I am a body out to sea and there is no one to undrown me. I strike out towards the shore. I must, I must. I set a point to push towards. I must, I must. I am the wind. I fight the waves. I am the wind that floods my lungs. I am the lighthouse and the call of wild birds. I am the lighthouse circling bright and I'm ashore. And she was seriously stressing about that today. She hadn't written anything when she left work here today. And she had to do it between when she left here and came back. So I thought that was pretty good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me just do a little spruik. Um, Busy Bird is not only a publisher, but we are actually in the education area. Les and Blaze, who are, uh, are not here, um, are very big in education and helping writers uh, craft their work and getting better. Um, if you know Les, he's probably the best editor in the world and he's an amazing person to teach you and Blazers as well. So um, we have a lot of different things coming up. We have boot camps coming up. Um, uh, I think it's uh, uh, June or July, something like that. Um, but we actually have our bar Busy Bird Barley Writing Retreat which is uh, still going on, and June the 8th to the 13th. It's a big step for us to actually uh, take people overseas and do it that. So um, if you're looking for, or you know someone that's looking for a bit of pampering, everything that Bali has to offer, plus amazing um, you know, mentorship with your work, um, you can't go past that. So you know, ring Blaze and Les and have a chat if you're interested in that. All right. What are the dates for boot camp? I've forgotten. Boot camp is from the 27th, 27th and 28th of April. It's a Saturday and Sunday. It covers off in the first session planning your book. The second session is on the Saturday afternoon is writing. Sunday, first session is publishing. And the last session on the Sunday is marketing. So it covers the whole life cycle. Yep. And yeah, if I'm here at work. So we've, we've found boot camp is amazing. You come in and you get two days intensive, you learn how to write, what to do with your book, how to get it out there and then market it, which marketing for as all you guys know as, as, public, as authors, you know, writing the book and getting it into, into your hand is probably almost the easy bit. It's the where to, where to put it, how to market and get it into bookshops. So we can help you with that. Okay, who am I? Last one. Kev. Yep. Kev. <laughs> I was born in 1947, Portland, America. My first professional short story was called The Glass Floor. I had a normal nine to five job, but in the night I was writing stories for men's magazines such as Cavalier. 1971, I became a teacher. Jeez, I don't know your authors. I got one, I got past about four, hey, four hey, questions. What did you say? Did I say uh, Stephen King? Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many good. Can I, can I actually read? Going, you know. Can I actually read? Um, he has a, a philosophy on writing. And if you want to actually hear Stephen King's philosophy on writing, because I actually thought it was pretty good. It says, you must read and write for at least four to six hours a day. Now, who's got that time? Seriously? No, that doesn't happen. You can, if you cannot find time for that, you cannot expect to become a good writer. He sets out each day with a quota of writing 2,000 words and will not go to sleep unless he writes them. His also simple definition for talent in writing is, if you have written something and you have sent it out and you receive a check for that and you have cashed that check and it didn't bounce and you use that money to pay your electricity bill, I consider you talented. <laughs> I think it's pretty good because it's it breaks it right down to 
how you need to do it. Mm. All right, Lucky, is there anyone else here apart from Steve? Oh, yeah. can I <laughs> um, is there anyone else, apart from yep. Steve, that wants to read? No? Anyone? I think everyone's on. I actually thought I'd leave Steve last because I thought he was going to do these funny, jokey things, but actually I've just read it says opinion piece, so I thought we were going to finish on a funny note, but uh, no. we're not. Okay. <laughs> Steve DeGarda, everybody. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit of a religious theme, but you see, we'll do a funny bit talking about because I lost my wife seven years ago. And um, one of the things when you do lose a partner, it does free you up for making decisions around the house, like if you need to buy new furniture or buy a new car. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to have that discussion as to you know, what should we do, it's, it's all up to you. And then, but one night I had a dream and I was changing things around the house and Maria was there. We said, oh no, you can't do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. But, but you're not here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> So you still get nagged in the afterlife. Um, you do. Yeah, but uh, today I'm doing a big reveal. I am coming out. I'm a religious fundamentalist. But don't worry, I'm still a progressive Christian, and, and, and in fact, I'm a progressive, progressive Catholic. Uh, but essentially because I'm a progressive Christian that I'm a, consider myself a religious fundamentalist. So let me explain. I consider myself to be a religious, religious fundamentalist because I fervently believe that all religions are based on the same fundamental premise. The premise is that we're all part, part of, or owe our allegiance to, a higher power and our combined worth is greater than the sum of our parts. All religions are based on this fundamental belief and all religions believe that because of this belief, we need to respect the needs and wishes of others, prevent the exploitation of our environment, and give thanks for the world we live in and the people, plants and animals that we share it with. We need to do these things not because it's good to be, just good to be nice to other people, but because we cannot separate ourselves from the entity we belong to and we must be good to ourselves. I believe this because I believe religion to be inseparable from our existence. And even though the specific details of modern religions are largely a human construct, belief in a greater power or purpose is a feature of all indigenous cultures and supported by what we know of our creation. In what appears to be a fluke cosmic calamity, there was a big bang. And from that bang came the universe, galaxies and planets. And on one of those planets, cosmic matter led to the formation of living things. And miracle of miracles, we somehow came to be sentient beings on that planet. And the only sentient beings that we are aware of in the whole universe. Although modern science has only recently discovered the origins of our existence, all indigenous cultures have had belief systems that essentially support the theories of quantum physics and astrophysics. We owe our existence to a single act of creation that produced us and the environment we live in, and we must worship and respect that. Modern religions have drawn on, the, on this basic premise, but the premise has been adapted and transformed. Modern religions also honour and worship historical figures who have helped focus our insight into what it means to be human and what it means to owe allegiance to the creator or the act of creation. Human creatures are taking comfort from the certainty and clarity provided by these individuals, the explanations of our existence. An existence that is in fact as improbable as it is random. None of these individuals considered themselves to be greater than creation itself. But there, there have been others who followed them who sought to manipulate 
the insights of their teachings of respect, love, tolerance and forgiveness into doctrines that must be adhered to to honour the Creator. The doctrines that became cultural norms and a means of emphasising the difference between cultures and societies. In extreme cases, these doctrines have led to a form of religious fundamentalism that we are all familiar with. The one where people are led to believe that their religion is the only true faith and anyone who does not accept this is an, is an enemy with whom one must not fraternise and in extreme cases must eliminate. But this form of religious fundamentalism is diametrically opposed to the fundamental beliefs that led to the creation of religions in the first place, which is that we are all part of the same entity and our collective worth is greater than the sum of our parts. Because modern religions are largely a human construct, it is not possible to separate cultural norms from religious beliefs. Our diversity in religious belief is a product of how the fundamental truths of our creation have been interpreted by various cultures at various times. But those of us who understand these fundamental truths see different styles of worship as various means to the same ends. That, are, that of focusing our collective energies to respecting the needs and wishes of others, preventing the exploitation of our environment and giving thanks for the world we live in and the people and plants and animals we share it with. This is the religious fundamentalism that I believe in and the one I want the world to understand. Thank you. Okay, that was, that was not a joke, was it? It was very heavy. <laughs> Normally Steve comes up and does singing and joking and stuff, so that was... And cooking. Yeah. Okay, we've come to the end of the night. So everyone like to get out their little ticky tickets tickets? The door prize tonight is Busy Bird has um, created a series of books called Healthy Spirit, Healthy Mind, Healthy Body. So whoever wins can pick the one that they relate to best. That's all right. Have we got the tickets? Yeah, normally whoever sits next to Richard wins. So I'm not even gonna. So right. Oh yeah, Rosemary. Oh, oh. F14. That's you. Mm -hmm. oh, that's not me. 14? No? It's got to be a 14 somewhere. <laughs> really? Dun, dun, dun. No, no one's got a 14. Put too many. Someone that came oh, later. Not so early. No. Did anyone come up with friends? No, no, she's 15. I'm so 15. Redraw. Do it again. We'll do a redraw. All right, here we go. 14's out. Yeah. They just appeared into probably Paul. Probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> dun dun dun. F09. Yay. Hey. Yay. So the last prize I won here was, or the only prize I won here was Healthy Body. Okay. So I'm going to go for Healthy Spirit. Beautiful. Excellent. <laughs> well, again, everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I think you all agree that was a big mix of stuff, wasn't it? That was, really, that was a genres to funny, happy heavy whatever I thought that was fantastic so for, for a smaller group that was really well done so stay have some food the uh, urns on the wines open have some nibbles and um, yeah we hope to see you again next month thank you for coming